all just want to thank everyone who uh, has joined us today and those of us that are logged in here as well as all the other viewers on Facebook and other platforms. Super excited about today's session. Um, just to, to start with introductions, my name is Nick Miller. I'm the executive director of the Venture College at Boise State, uh, where we help students launch their ventures beyond the classroom. And back in March, uh, we uh, started partnering with Trailhead uh, around this effort. We, we partner with Trailhead and a lot of other folks in our ecosystem uh, around a variety of things. Uh, but back in March when the pandemic hit, uh, we started trying to recreate uh, the community of startups and entrepreneurs that uh, was really thriving in Boise uh, in this format to try to, to give people an opportunity to access the information and resources and individuals that they need to push their ideas forward. Uh, so as part of that, I think this is um, you know, the 16th time that we've got together. Uh, and, and we've been talking a lot about you know, different things that startups can do to, to ensure that they survive um, these challenging times and ultimately thrive on the other side of them. Uh, and, and we also know that there are uh, challenges that are unique to specific populations, uh, to specific sectors and, and industries. And so today's session, we'll really end up talking uh, about the challenges that are unique to women entrepreneurs. And we are really honored to have Mary Kate Johnson uh, from Zions Bank in Goliad, Idaho, and Diane Bevon uh, with the Idaho Women's Business Center. And you know, both of them are leading in this space um, and are doing just incredible work uh, here in Boise as well as across the entire state. And uh, so I'm just excited to hear from them today. Uh, so maybe before we kick it off, uh, I'll turn it over to Mary Kate and then uh, to Diane and just ask you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your role uh, and, and who you're with and we'll go from there. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Nick. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Kate Johnson, and I am a private banker with Zions Bank here in Idaho. And I am also a Go Lead Idaho past president and current treasurer for the organization, having been with them for the last five years. Great. Thank you so much, Nick um, and team for hosting us. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Diane Bevan. I'm the executive director for the Idaho Women's Business Center. And we just celebrated our first year anniversary, but our team certainly isn't new to entrepreneurship. I think my first time I actually created something that I sold, I was 16. And, and so in one capacity or another, I've been running a business in many different arenas, which is what drew me so much to the WBC and that opportunity to, to help women in business and maybe learn some things from my school of hard knocks as well as maybe learn and be able to teach some of the things that I didn't even know I didn't know. So thank you so much for the opportunity to participate today. Great. Well, thank both of you for, for joining us. Um, Tim, would you like to kick it off? Yeah, why don't we do this? Um, Diane, since we heard from you last, tell us a little bit about the, the mission of the center, the work that you are, that you have done so far, and just generally, um, maybe also a sense of the geography that you cover. Great, thank you, Tim. So first of all, our mission is to serve all women. But that includes all cultures and communities. And when I wrote the mission statement for the WBC, I wanted to make sure that we included that we serve all communities because it really is our goal to be fully statewide. And I think in some ways the pandemic has helped with that. In some ways it's kind of slowed us down a little bit as far as actually being boots on the ground in those areas. But we want to make sure that when we go out to rural areas that we're not just serving our women entrepreneurs, but, but everybody in those communities. And so that's always been a big part of what we do is, as we always say, you know, we do welcome guys to the WBC. Um, our grant doesn't always count them as far as our metrics, but we certainly serve everybody that comes into our path. And we work very closely with, um, 
we are uh, funded in part by a cooperative agreement with the SBA. And for that reason, we really look at our partners with SBDC and PTAC and some of the other organizations that are resource partners as well. And so um, we've just really focused in the last um, two months and three months on, on helping get as many entrepreneurs to access to funding. That's our biggest goal is to see if they qualify for any of the resources that are out there. So that's kind of been our big push, but we certainly do um, try to be statewide. We are opening um, our Eastern Idaho office in Idaho Falls um, this in the next month and having a off of it in October. And then we're almost, we're getting really close to finding an office in Moscow. So um, wow. We're trying to be, yeah, we're, we're, we have that job seats out there. We just hired someone actually today uh, in Idaho Falls, and the office there will be located in the Innovation Center uh, with Brian McElvey's space. Uh, that could be long term or it could be NRM uh, until we get that new trailhead Eastern Idaho business up and running too, and we'll join partnerships there. But we love collaboration, and I think that's why these events are so great, Nick, is because. You know, when you can get Trailhead and Boise State Venture College and Science Bank and the Women's Business Center, I mean, the more partnerships that we create, the more we can just help people. And there isn't any one size fits all. Any entrepreneur will tell you that, you know, and so I think that it's just so important, the work that everybody's doing. So it sounds like a big emphasis on funding as of late. I want to take a deep dive into that here just in a moment. But also just let me take this moment and say, your organization is physically growing um, its footprint during a global pandemic. Um, that's great news for, for our communities and not just the women in Idaho, but apparently everyone in Idaho that may have a need to come see someone in your office. Mary Kate, if you could give us an, an overview, maybe mission, maybe purpose of, of Go Lead Idaho and kind of give us a sense of how, how did you get involved um, um, from your job at Zions to Go Lead Idaho? Absolutely. So I've been in banking for over two decades. And in that time, I've been given the opportunity to dive outside of the organization and go into the community. And I've always been passionate about helping women entrepreneurs, women in business, women in corporate level um, C-suite positions. And it's just amazing to me how there are so many different organizations here in Idaho that want to help women and help them succeed. So having been involved with Go Lead Idaho for the last seven years and being on their board for the last five years, I've had the opportunity to help women in leadership roles, help them um, to find, like Diane was saying, just really building that network and building that community of women entrepreneurs working with Zions has given me that financial side of that spectrum. So I've been able to work with them on the financing piece. And like Diane said, it's pretty hard for women to find funding. So being able to give them another avenue for that funding has been really important for me. And I'm just so impressed. We live in such an amazing community. I come from, I won't, you know, bag too much on, on Nevada, but I got to tell you, Idaho is just absolutely amazing the way that we really come together and help women. Well, since it's come up from, from, from both of you, let's, let's tackle this issue right away. Uh, women and funding, women entrepreneurs and funding. The statistics are pretty stark. I think the last time I checked, it was in the single digit percentiles in terms of the total venture and I'm talking about venture capital here, the amount of venture capital released into the market I think only something like between three and seven percent made it to women founders and so that's for early stage startups and post revenue startups so let's talk about the kind of, of the women entrepreneurs that the two of you work with so what kind of diane what kind of funding are you talking about here are we talking a bank loan was this a triple p is um tell us more about the kinds of funding that the the women that you work with are after Great. Thanks, Tim. And, you know, it, it is all about the money. You know, you have a pool of entrepreneurs. I mean, women are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. And when you really break those numbers down, the minority women are even the larger percentage of the women starting businesses. And so that number should be so much higher than, than what you refer to. And, and so one of the things that has really been an eye opener through COVID is like you talk about the, you know, the paycheck protection program and the EIDL and all of those. 
there were there were quite a few women that we were successfully able to get to the table and to get funding for them through many of our financial partners. But equally, there was a larger number that didn't qualify. And it wasn't because they didn't have a great business. It was really goes right back down to the basics of how they structured their business. And if you can picture in your mind, you have a single mom that's working two jobs. She's got a side hustle. She's got a job on the side. And when she receives money for her product service or whatever, the first thing that goes to her mind is paying her rent, going and buying groceries. It's not I need to take this money, put it in a business check checking account, and then actually have a transaction where I show how I pay myself. And that really was that line in the sand. And so, you know, at the end of the day, we still have many women that really have to get access to funding. And so we actually, right now, while we're on this live, we actually have a live going on right now on the WBC for crowdfunding. Uh, we will be the first women business center in the country to post a uh, crowdfunding platform as part of our deliverables. And because we, you know, the women have a compelling story. And I think statistically in crowdfunding and other different ways of raising money, um, sometimes that can actually be more successful than going down the bank path, but that doesn't, that doesn't discount the need to become bankable. And so um, for us right now, we're really identifying the true barrier of our client goes very back to the very basics of introducing them to financial partners like Mary Kate. And let's just start with opening business banking and start because we, you know, I think originally we came out uh, kind of at that mid learning level with the Women Business Center. And what we have learned through COVID-19 is that we have to even go back to the basics and teach our business owners how to become business owners and not just producers of product or services. Well, it sounds very familiar. Um, believe it or not, most tech entrepreneurs also are very passionate and um, knowledgeable about the widget, the product, whatever it is that they're building. But then building the business around it is a very challenging step, um, not just for women entrepreneurs, for all entrepreneurs. So you've touched on a few things there. Um, Mary-Kate, the conversations that you are having... It, Tell us about the kind of funding women are after or, or are there challenges in women businesses becoming bankable? Because it sounds like, you know, there's a process that Diane is describing from, from the basics um, to the point where you can become bankable and sort of filling that gap. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. There, you know, one thing that I really want to make sure that we know is there are so many different women out there and Oftentimes, women-owned businesses, unfortunately, are not considered essential. And it's, that's one of the, the, I guess you could say, roadblocks that banks face with these women. So when we partner with organizations like the Idaho Women's Business Center, it is so important. And one of the things that we're seeing is these women businesses have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. And what they're looking for is access to capital. So whether that's through crowdfunding, whether that's through venture capitalists, and oftentimes those venture capital firms are owned by, by men. And so a lot of these businesses are just not, it's hard sometimes for these men to find the value of those women-owned businesses. A um, couple different women-owned businesses that come to mind that are greatly successful is Salt, um, Red Aspen, so those are some women-owned businesses, and if you are familiar with those businesses, their products are towards women. Um, and so that's that's one of the, I guess you could say, roadblocks of going to venture capitalists is that sometimes you just you you face that roadblock. But um, in a banking aspect, we really do look for those bankable clients, and those bankable clients have the good credit, they have the good character. Um, they, they've got the cash flow and oftentimes entry level entrepreneurs, that's just not something that they have. And so it is so important that we connect them to, you know, places like the Idaho uh, Women's Business Center. Also the Zions Bank has a business center. So these resources are so important because those entry level entrepreneurs, you know, you got to crawl before you can walk. And so it's really important to divert them back to those organizations yeah the importance of those partnerships back to diane was diane was saying i can't count the number of people i've sent over the oh, yeah. 
doing at the oh absolutely absolutely that so, that partnership is imperative absolutely and for what i understand karen a large part of the work that she does with with her team in helping entrepreneurs and a lot of women entrepreneurs um and i think it's worth noting karen also had a background with the former idaho women's business center yeah a lot of it is nuts and bolts, financial forecasting, pro forma, income statements, really the kind of artifacts and information in the business that you use to go sell it and tell a story yeah. to banks. And so that was interesting to me. You know, I just, you know, before understanding what kind of work is being done at the, at the resource center there at Zions Bank, yeah. it was just eye-opening to me. We don't spend at Trail at a whole lot of time on pro forma finance forecasting. Sure mostly on product, how do you build a business and build a team around yourself? And so, you know, that said, Diane, in, in expanding to um, Moscow and, uh, and, and Idaho Falls, you know, tell us, give us an, a sense of scope. So how many, how many people walk through your door on an annual basis? How many, how many women do you serve in Idaho? So that's an awesome question. Um, you know, up until the pandemic, we had had about 500 women-owned businesses put their businesses on our exclusive directory on our website, either by us advising them to or them just organically doing that. But when COVID hit, we set up an emergency portal on our website that says, we want to hear from you. We want to know if you feel like you're going to have a loss and how we can help you. And within three weeks, we had 263 businesses from all over the state reach out to us. And that kind of escalated that need to be in Idaho Falls and in Moscow. And even though we, we are still doing everything via Zoom and virtual, from our original tech proposal a year ago, we said that we would open affiliate off satellite offices in those areas. But the needs kind of gotten pushed up a little bit. And you know, the question about how many people walk through your door, I don't know that that's ever going to be a large, large number. I think that a lot of our generational uh, entrepreneurs aren't getting in their car, driving to a location and walking in, but they're certainly connecting with us through social media. And But having those physical offices sends a mindset to that area that we care about you enough that we set up camp in your northern area or in your eastern area. and and having that person that has those connections of, of outreach will increase the number of people that we serve in those areas. I mean, we didn't, we could run it with a full team here in the Treasure Valley if we're all gonna stay virtual, but I just think that it, it's that community, right? It's that community of saying, we're coming to you. And um, that rural growth initiative that I, 44 by 22, that I've talked about so much of being able to impact women in business in all 44 counties by year 2022. And the basis of that was finding those local champions and doing a training trainer and allowing them to teach entrepreneurial trainings of cash flow statements and pro formas in their local libraries with a group of five entrepreneurs locally. So part of it really is to just put a coach um, a coach in as many corners as we can so that we can continually coach and train the people in their area. So I don't know that the, and that's a long answer to a short question, but I don't know that we'll have a lot of people still just walking in the door. Um, we weren't seeing that with our WBCs in Nampa or Boise even pre-COVID, but I think that the more places that were represented, the more numbers that we see. And we talk about this, Diane, you and I, at times, the rural urban divide in Idaho. You know, we, we, at times we, we were so proud and so into the programs that and, and the resources that we have here in Boise, but then really for Boise, the Valley, the state, all of us have to win. And so I just applaud your efforts and, and, I, and I can appreciate how difficult it can be to, to bridge that rural urban divide, whether it's brick and mortar or it's digital, it's, it's difficult to do. And so I applaud you and your organization. Mary Kate, in terms of, you know, banks, play a very integral role of community, especially small communities. And if you talk about, you know, rural Idaho, Zions Bank obviously comes to mind. Um, in, in terms of, you know, Zions, Zions' reach across the state, can, can you tell us about any efforts on Zions and um, to work with women entrepreneurs specifically that are in rural areas? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. One of the things that I think is important to highlight is that uh, for 2019, our fiscal year, we helped over 38% of our small business entrepreneurs get SBA loans. And so 
That's really big. And we want to keep growing that number because women make up over 70% of the buying decisions in the household. That's huge. So anytime that there's a purchase, we're the ones who are really driving that ship. And so it's really important that we, we highlight these women business owners because as women, we're going to gravitate towards things that pique our interest, towards things that we're excited about. So Zions recognizes that. And that's, you know, Diane talked about having that physical presence um, up in Moscow and so forth. And so for Zions Bank, when we did put our flagship corporate center here in Idaho, that was really what we were doing is we wanted people in Idaho and the community to know that we do want to have an Idaho presence and we do want to be able to make those big decisions locally. And we do have different offices in New Plymouth, Fruitland, up in Northern Idaho. And that's important because we do want to have that brick and mortar for people to go into, but also people are doing things a lot more electronically, a lot more remotely, and even before COVID. But especially now after COVID, it's so important that we do have these resources available like we're doing now. And the Venture College has done such an impeccable job of getting this reach out to people, not just via Zoom, but also Facebook Live. So the different platforms. One thing that Go Lead Idaho has done is we've always had uh, training series. We've had them in the spring. We've had them in the fall. We had to cancel our spring one, unfortunately, during COVID. Um, but we are having a fall one, and we're going to do it virtually. So that's something that we've never done before, but we kept getting requests to have our fall training series, and we recognized that we needed to be adaptable under the circumstances. So we're going to be conducting that uh, virtually. And we've got um, the I mentioned earlier, Red Aspen. So she's going to be one of our, our speakers. So that'll be really exciting to hear from her as far as, you know, her entrepreneurial vision and, and how she's came to be where she is now. Very cool. So I recall joining a happy hour with Go Lead Idaho at Solid. Yeah. When yeah. we first met and I was, I right. witnessed a very engaging happy hour. It was less about the libations and it was more about the content, which yeah. for six o'clock on a weekday was pretty impressive. Have you picked Thank those you. up as well? Or are you kind of sidelining the happy hours? Are you focusing on the training? We're, we're sidelining, we're sidelining the happy hours right now, the networking um, events, which is such a bummer because it is, it is a lot of fun to get together with everyone and to visit. But for, for the time being, we're going to sideline it. We're going to try to come up with some more innovative ideas of how we can get more engagement, but yeah, unfortunately, right now, it's just going to be postponed. All right. Well, those, the fall series, I think um, we'd love to hear more about. And I know that uh, there's been a lot of interest in that. And, you know, everyone, I think, needs a happy hour right now uh, at some point. But, you know, I wanted to go back to the um, to some of the themes that you all are seeing. And obviously, funding uh, has been, uh, you know, something that, has come up time and again. Um, but w when you see someone maybe a little further upstream from the funding event, uh, what are some of those themes that stand out that might be challenges unique uh, to your clients? And kind of as a follow up to that, uh, what are some resources that you would recommend, whether it's through your organization uh, or others, uh, that they may be able to access to address some of those challenges? Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that first. So, so challenges, we're not just hit by those that were already in business. We, and I know that Tim can say that we all, we were already working with people that were just about ready to launch or they were working on their new business plan or they were just at that moment. And it kind of took the wind out of their cells a little bit. I mean, I think it did everybody, but when you were in that, like, I'm just, you know, I've been working really hard on this business plan and year and their financing and their SBA loan. I mean, Mary Kay can attest that there are a lot of brand new SBA loans that are happening right now that aren't due to COVID. They're due to people starting businesses. And so I think in the way of barriers, I mean, maybe they had to make some quick pivots. I can see on this class, Michaela Summers, I see her name on there. She, um, on this class today, she took a huge pivot from an accounting business that she and her mom had started making a makeup line and totally took a total hard pivot. In fact, you know, she sent me some samples that I 
testing for her. But I love that we have, you know, this community. I mean, to Mary Kate's point, I mean, Idaho is just, it's kind of special how we just kind of all rally together and, and recognize that there are women still trying to grow businesses. I think we're going to see um, a lot of people joining entrepreneurship during the pandemic. I think we're already seeing that is that people are making huge pivots and changes. So in some ways it's a barrier and in some ways it's a blessing. I think that, I think that the challenges that entrepreneurs have faced have caused them to look at maybe where they kind of knew they needed to make changes. They were just kind of in denial about it. You know, I think that the ones that have gotten turned down for funding have realized that they need to learn how to become bankable. And I think that those that maybe weren't happy with their corporate job and got furloughed realized they'd rather be their own boss. And so I think that we're actually seeing a, a lot of really cool things happen. I know, Mary Kate, are you seeing that also? As I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Diane. Um, you are, you're seeing women who have been furloughed. Um, you know, there was a really interesting article um, that had come out. I think Politico had wrote it maybe a couple weeks ago, but it just talked about the long, long-term impact that COVID-19 is going to have specifically on women. And the reason being is with schools going to this new hybrid model of virtual, in-person, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, it's the woman who's going to stay home and do the teaching. So maybe she's stepping back and taking a part-time position. Maybe she just left her job altogether. Um, and I think that when Diane talks about we're going to be seeing more women entrepreneurs, I agree with that 100%. We are. We're going to see a lot more women who are going to be resourceful because they, you know, maybe it's their, their full-time day job and after hours or what have you, they're, they're starting to think about different ways that they can make more of this passive income. And while today it may be their passive income with different guidances from the Idaho Women's Business Center, the Business Resource Center, what have you, this, this is going to become something that I, I'm really excited to see what it looks like in the next five, 10, 20 years for these new women entrepreneurs. And it is so important that they essentially built their tribe and that tribe looks like different resources from the business centers from their financial institution because at some point in one scope or another they do want to be bankable but unless they have that building block that they've gotten with their cash statements their balance statements etc it's unfortunately they won't have anything to stand on without that knowledge and I think they need accountability. I think that, you know, they always say that there's a lot more success, whether it's losing weight or building a business or whatever your challenge is, if you have someone that you're accountable to. And we ran quite a few focus groups right at the beginning of COVID. And we did, we did focus groups with our Spanish speakers, as well as just general public of entrepreneurs. And the number one thing that kind of came out to us was the need for a mentor. And, yeah. you know, a mentor isn't necessarily a trained, accredited business counselor, just someone that knows a little bit more than you do, that's willing to listen, that's not your spouse or in your inner circle, but can just be that um, objective person to kind of collaborate with. And we're really close to launching a mentoring software that'll have that algorithm to, uh, for any entrepreneur and anyone that wants to be a mentor or a mentee to kind of have those connections because for the, for even with the large number of people that we serve and at, at Trailhead and Boise and, and the Business Resource Center at Zion, for, for all of those hundreds of people, there are thousands more that aren't having anyone to talk their business through or have that accountability for. And so I think that that is one of the things that is a gap in our system right now is that we don't really have that messaging of you need to have a mentor in business to be a successful entrepreneur you've got to be have someone that is in your inner circle of tribe that can help you and so that is one of our biggest target areas statewide is to just to try to increase that ability of every entrepreneur having somebody that they can talk to yeah and i think i would touch a little bit on that too with um you know there are go lead idaho for example i will um, 
just those two come to mind immediately here locally. And those different organizations have women in them who are willing to be mentors, who know mentors. So perhaps the area of your expertise that you need that mentor in is in tech or is in fitness, what have you. Those different organizations know women and that's where that networking comes in and is so important because they can connect you with those different mentors. But I couldn't agree with you more, Diane. You, you've got to have that mentorship. And I think that that's something that women, we lack a little bit because I, I think that we just don't have more women who have come forward to say, hey, if you're looking for someone who needs a mentor, please put them in touch with me. I would love to help them. So I think that that's really important to have that as well. Well, both of you are touching on something that's, um, it's striking a chord. So I have this conversation with, you know, women founders often about mentorship. And some of the discrepancies that I see is, you know, as, as a male, it's sort of natural and it came organic that at some point without me even realizing a male peer of mine took me under his wing. And, and I, again, it wasn't conscious. I didn't say, hey, you're my mentor. I'm your mentee. It just happened. And then later, retrospectively, I realized, oh, okay, he was coaching me. He was mentoring me. How can I now do that for other guys, right? And so, you know, as, as I talk to women founders, that what I hear is, for one, the whole concept of mentorship is a, is a bit foreign to them. You know, going to someone to ask for help because most of the times in their lives, they're the ones that their kids and spouses come to for help. And so for one, it's, it's not natural for them, but also to your point, Mary Kate, um, those women who I believed, I said, I, I thought to myself, you would be a great mentor for so-and-so exactly for the reason you said, I said, you have expertise in this one area. So-and-so could benefit from that. There was hesitation to assume the mentor role to share to maybe let her wall down and share her secret sauce of success with someone else. So could you, the two of you speak to that a little bit? I know I'm touching on something potentially sensitive here, but hey, that's why I'm having this talk today. You know, I, I have heard more times than not from different women that some women don't necessarily want to share that secret sauce, as you said, because I had to blaze that trail. I had to do the hard, hard work. So you know what? I think that you too need to experience that. Whereas why can't I tell you some of the hardships that I faced, how I felt, how I got through it, and what you possibly could do to avoid that as well. So it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that. And Diane, I don't know if you've experienced that, but it's almost like sometimes women are like, you you got to you got to walk that hard road that I did too. Oh, I I think that to a certain element that that is true and I think that I think that there's that fear of insecurity to be vulnerable and to talk about what you're struggling and I think women view it more as a sign of weakness than men do. I mean, we take it so personally. In fact, I talked about that on an event last week that you know, asking for help is not a sign of weakness, but to women it kind of is and or if someone knows that they're a mentee versus a mentor, then it means that they're not doing well. Or, um, and so I think that we do have a challenge. I think it's going to be, you know, we've set up this new software to really be algorithm based. And um, we're hoping that, that we get a really good response on mentors and mentees, because I do think it's something that needs to happen. I've benefited from mentors. There were times when I was a business owner owning a wedding event center and two prom and bridal retail stores that I could have really used a mentor. I was really way over my head trying to run three businesses at one time and have four small children and one of them was 45 minutes from my house, one of my businesses was. And so obviously I wasn't running that business because you can't be in three places at once. And, and I'm trying to decide if at that time if I would have welcomed a mentor or not. I think I probably would have. I think that there are women that if we can make it become more of a topic of discussion of having a mentor and having someone that, you know, like Kim, you said you had one organically and you didn't even realize that at the time, but now you're in a position where you can mentor. That's kind of how I feel right now. You know, I've run businesses most of my life 
And now this opportunity to mentor entrepreneurs has been um, really a bonus for me, for sure. And we just have to, and I, I agree with Mary Kate. There are so many great women at I will and go lead. I mean, I could probably need 20 people right now off the top that would be great mentors and willing. So then we have to just, and I think I could immediately name 20 entrepreneurs that if I said, you know what, if you could have someone that you could safely talk about your business without any fear of them, you know, duplicating it, knocking you off, would you be open to having those conversations? 100% yes. So I think it's just going to be in how we all work together to make it not seem weird or negative, but how it can really help change that, that pivot point in business. I'm excited. Yeah, it's going to be good. I, I see it too. And I've been so fortunate in my banking career that I have had such strong women mentors in the finance world. I, I just, and you know, and I, I say luck, but I sought them out. And I think that that's something important too, to encourage our entrepreneurs that we do encounter is seek them out they're not always going to come to you and they may not always be, you know, the face of the company or what it is, but um, look into it, look into different women that are in the position that either you want or the type of business that you're trying to attain, reach out to them and just say, I really admire you. I, I really like what you're doing. Can we get together and talk? I'd love to pick your brain. I'd love to see what, what makes you tick, how you got to be where you're at. And hopefully you'll, you'll get a positive reception. And if you don't, I would take that little piece of experience, if you will, and just know that at some point I will be in a position and I'm going to remember what this is like so that I can foster the women that will come behind me. So I think that that's something to keep in mind as well. I really like the uh, the definition that you gave, Diane, of a, someone who can be your mentor, and it's someone who doesn't have to be a you know domain expert. They just know a little bit more than you do, and and I think that's that's super helpful. And and for me, it means that most of the world is eligible to be my mentor because it's you know most people know a lot more than I do. Um, but I I wanted to kind of touch on this because I think you know your your comment, Mary Kate, of just reach out and, and ask is, um, it's a great one. And I think that, you know, everyone has to be bold when making these statements and put themselves somewhat, make themselves somewhat vulnerable. Um, and I think right now it's actually a unique opportunity because, you know, locally, regionally, nationally, and globally, people are somewhat more available, even though we're all isolated, right? So people are more willing to take that time and so I'm wondering if you, you know, one, if you can share more about the fall events that you have coming up with Go Lead Idaho, because it sounds like those are great opportunities to get engaged with leaders. Um, but then two, if you've attended uh, any, you know, regional or national events, or if you know of any organizations um, locally, regionally, nationally, that you'd recommend uh, people get involved with so that they can start having access to some of that uh, next level mentoring uh, that we've talked Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Um, so just off the top of my head, you know, Go Lead Idaho, like I mentioned, so we're an organization that we motivate women to lead and we demonstrate why it matters. And so being a leader and being an entrepreneur looks so different for everyone. So just because I am in the financial corporate world, I'm also a leader within my household. I'm also a leader within my community with my my civic duties that I do and so forth. So women entrepreneurs and women mentors and women leaders, one person wears different hats. Um, Go Lead Idaho, I Will, um, Women Ignite, those are just three off the top of my head that I think are absolutely fantastic. The women who are involved in those organizations are so passionate. Um, and I think as far as professionally, there's a couple different organizations and I actually wrote down the names because I can't remember the, the, the meaning of the acronym. I know the acronym. Um, so NEW, for example, and that is the Network of Entrepreneurial Women Worldwide. And Diane, if I'm already repeating some things that you're going to say, forgive me. 
um, but also the World Association of Women Entrepreneurs. Those two organizations are nationally and internationally, and they're just, they're absolutely fantastic just to take things on a, on a bigger level, on a bigger spectrum. So um, those are some, some good resources to look into just for the, the bigger spectrum. Awesome. Diane, anything to, to add to that? So we're always launching a plethora of events. We've had two happening while we've been on this call, but um, for the fall, we have the Global Entrepreneurial Week, which is um, the second week of November. Uh, there are events all over the world, and I think most of them this year are going to be virtual. And I think that each state and country try to come up with just the best of the best for that week. So I would highly suggest as people are starting to put those events on the global event calendar, that could be really fun uh, for people to attend things outside of their state. Um, but in tune, we certainly wanted Idaho to show up. So I've created Crowdfund Idaho Live. So if you can picture kind of like American Idol, but crowdfunding, we're going to identify 10 entrepreneurs all across Idaho, and they'll each represent a community in a crowdfund campaign. And we'll show their audition video as well as after they've gone through our crowdfunding uh, training over the next six to eight weeks. And then the, their crowdfund will go live. But the audience will be able to do some live voting on them. And uh, so it's going to be a really fun thing. It'll be like Monday night at seven o'clock and we'll have the governor read a declaration about Global Entrepreneur Week. So we're going to try to create, create a really fun um uh, event. So anybody on this call, I know that Tim, you and Nick work with a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, we're, we want each uh, 10 competitors and from all over corners of the states to compete in their craft and to tell their story. So that's some of the big things that we Very have cool. coming on. Yeah, it's going to be super fun. And, you know, next year we want to do some like women in STEM and women in ag. And so things like that. But the Association of Women Business Centers, the AWBC, the national organization, they put out a lot of great trainings, and so does the NWBC that our local Jess Flynn serves on that council, the National Women's Business Council. So following the AWBC and the NWBC, um, I think are really great. They do a lot of great training for women entrepreneurs. And in two weeks, uh, I am actually joining the board of the Association of Women Business Centers. So that'll be another one for Idaho that we'll have a board member on both of those national councils. Wow. All right. Let me let me switch gears and go back to something here. I, I'm not. I, I can't let go of this quite yet. Um, Diane, earlier you said something that kind of made me think about. Reminded me of my mother. You said something along the lines of, um, of the women, of the percentage of women entrepreneurs. A large chunk of them are minority women. So then I was thinking back. I go, you know what? My mother is a minority woman. Uh, she started a business, and the impetus for her was really you know, a path to financial independence, um, a path to economic empowerment, which were all, you know, uh, uh, topics that mattered to her at the time. And so as I think about the pandemic, and I overlay this with what I just said, my, my natural inclination would have been to assume that because of the pandemic, there's going to be less women entrepreneurs. They're going to basically take a hit and and, and, and suffer from this as a, as a group, as a community. But what you, the two of you are saying is, wait a minute, the pandemic is going to be an impetus for quite the opposite. Um, it's exposed some fault lines and some opportunities for improvement, if you will, for a lot of these women entrepreneurs. And so as I heard that, you know, I've been telling the story about Trailhead along the same lines. Post-pandemic, places like Trailhead and universities economic support centers around community typically do well. It's right now that we sort of look at, you know, a couple of months ahead and we, we want to survive in order to thrive, hence the name of this, um, of this episode here. So can you tell me a little bit about the future? You expect this to really take off and, 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 and women to, you know, uh, Mary Kate, you say that this next wave of women entrepreneurs, that got me really excited and I'm thinking in my head, what do I need to do at Trailhead to A, help make that happen? And then when it happens, what do I do to support it and facilitate it? Do you want to go first, Mary-Kate? Sure. Um, number one, I think it's so important for women to 
get support and that support starts at home. So sitting down with your spouse or your partner and telling them, I need your support. I think that that's super imperative because like Diane mentioned, and I couldn't agree with her more, we are going to see women entrepreneurs who are going to get crafty and they are going to do what women do and they are going to get so creative and so motivated. I really do believe we're going to see a big boom with women entrepreneurs. And I think what businesses can do is to recognize that and to just advertise the excitement that they're going to see and mirror that excitement that they're going to get from women entrepreneurs. So really advertising that A, we're a resource, B, we support the women entrepreneurs in our community and C, what can we do to help support you? Well, you've got a directory of women entrepreneurs at the Idaho Business Resource Center. You've got women who are in organizations that specifically cater towards women and motivating them to lead. So I think that that's a great start, what businesses can do, what the Trailhead can do, what the Boise Venture College can do, is just to have those resources and those names readily available for them so that when they do come to us, we also can recognize that, okay, we've, we've got some support from these different organizations around you know, the state. Well, and there's, there's no secret, team, that you've put out some stellar women-owned businesses out of Trailhead. I mean, you have quite the success list of women entrepreneurs that have been innovative and creative and brought in new, new tech products. And, and I think that that's going to continue. I think, I think two things we're going to see. We're going to see the woman entrepreneur that has been so beat down by the pandemic that she closes her business and goes and finds a job. 100%. We are going to find the ones that that powered through, that were creative. They took their business online. They started making makeup instead of doing people's bookkeeping. You know, all of those things. And they're the ones that are going to power through, become stronger from it, and be better entrepreneurs. Then you're going to have the women, like Mary Kate talked about, that are now working from home. They've got children. They're also homeschooling. They've had an idea in the back of their head for 10 years that they've said, you know, this is a really good invention that I've never pursued. Those are going to be the ones that are going to, I think we're going to see a lot of new innovation come out of the pandemic, a lot of new products and some new entrepreneurs. It's going to be fantastic. And they all need to go and meet with you and Matt, because you guys do have that secret sauce of taking that ideation of an idea to a patent, to a product, to a business. And I think that you'll continue to do that. And I agree with Mary Kate, the more that the, the Venture College and Trailhead and other resource partners publicly come out and say, you know, we support women. We want to, you know, we want to hear what your next big idea is. And, and I think that as we all collaborate together, we're going to, I'm so excited. Like I see this all really happening. We're going to see this shift. Some are going to go back into the workplace and a whole lot are never going to go back to the workplace. And instead they're going to launch that business they wanted to for years. And so, you know, there's a part of me that's super excited about, about post COVID and what we're going to see. It's going to be a lot of fun. What I'm hearing is certainly a source of uh, motivation and inspiration, much needed, almost feels like a Monday. Um, but on that note, we Boise Startup Week has to work with both Go Lead Idaho and the Women's um, Business Center to make sure that uh, we tell these stories in a couple of months, the week of October 26. So balls in my court on, on that with both of you. So expect an email asking for a quick meeting and then for you to get involved into Startup Week. We would love that. Hey, got two yeses, got witnesses, love it. <laughs> it's recorded if you need it back. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good. Well, and, you know, we have like put out Boise Startup Week just like in our newsletter and we've reshared your post, but that's not enough. Like it, the, the people that we need to reach are the ones that aren't already following you. They're not already following uh, Go Lead or the Women's Business Center. And so I think that we can't talk enough in just our, even our personal posts and our daily posts about the importance of collaborative partners. Um, I, I truly believe in the pay it forward. It's really about the economic growth. It's about Idaho. It's about um, creating more resources, but the resources are there. It's about getting the word out in part of just about 
you know, letting people know what resources are out there. And I think that telling the stories in some way, social media has really helped with that. But do you guys feel that it's also become extremely crowded? Where normally you could pull, when you were kind of, TM, you guys have been doing virtual events way prior to COVID and you had really great, huge attendance. I mean, have you felt like things have gotten a little bit crowded virtually? Certainly, yes. Um, I think there are a lot more people, entities, and places that are trying to get your attention. And so as we all, not all of us, but most of us, and certainly the four of us, we're all at home, working from home. Um, it's, it's a different ball game when it comes to getting people's attention when they're already zoomed out. That's kind of a new, new term. Um, back to back Zoom meetings and then to encourage them to get on another virtual event is difficult because in the past those events were the, the, the breath of fresh air. It was you could, you know, check out of the, the typical corporate work environment and go to an event and network, maybe have a beverage or have some appetizers and, and just chat with someone. And so I think the virtual environment hasn't been able to solve for that quite yet. And, and you know, even myself, I... I sign up for probably two to three virtual events a week. I may attend one of them. And I usually end up, you know, kicking the can down the road because work comes up. I want to do it. It sounds great. But when it comes down to it, I, I, I think that the space is so crowded with my own work that comes from my own organization that I have very little time to look outward for content. Startup week is going to be a test. You know, we're, this is the first time we're doing this. We don't have a playbook for this, which kind of makes it exciting. And if it wasn't the crazy startup week people to figure this out, who else would? And so we're taking a crack at it and, and, and see, we'll see how it works. A big portion of these online events, Diane, has been something that you mentioned that you're working on. It's been the artificial intelligence backbone to matchmaking whether that's mentorship matchmaking or networking matchmaking between clients and vendors and suppliers. I, I think there's a lot to be gained in, in that sense. And Startup Week chose Brella, which is our platform for that very reason. Its core competency is to matchmake people. So we're trying to solve for that, you know, th those attributes that you lose when you go in person. Yeah, I think that that's really important. And I, you know, one of the things that I miss a lot being just in the office is when you get that entrepreneur who comes in to talk to you and they literally come in and they've got a napkin and on that napkin is this idea that that is the entrepreneur that I love seeing is just that napkin idea taking it to, I mean, we've, we've all seen it, you know, Diane, we could swap stories all day about those folks that come in and it's just, you know, the, I would have women come into my office and they would have their kids in the strollers and there's just nothing more special than talking with that woman, telling her, wow, this is awesome. And then taking it from A and watching her get to Z. That, that is what this is all about. Yeah, I agree. And then I also go back, but on the flip side, I go to the woman that lives four or five hours from here in rural Idaho that it's like having those Zoom calls and being excited even through your computer is still something they've never experienced. And so I think that there's going to be a beauty of both because I do miss the in-person but uh, what I love is the reach. I love the reach that we're, that we're, is now become normal, you know? And so I think in some ways, people that maybe weren't so willing to even download Zoom and use it are now realizing that they can connect with resources for their willingness to become a little more tech savvy. I think we can all learn something from deploying technology to bridge geographical gaps. Sure, yeah. I, you recall You Lead Idaho, which is the program that you were a judge for. If it wasn't for remote learning, we wouldn't have been able to reach those corners in the state. And that was before COVID. I mean, we were kind of looked at as, are you crazy? You're going to have all these kids get on a laptop and learn about entrepreneurship and give a Shark Tank style pitch? Yeah, then we were crazy. Now it's crazy if you don't have that. And so... You know, we're, we're looking at this um, 
really as an opportunity as well for Trailhead to, to, yeah. to help build this ecosystem of partnerships. Because at the end of the day, especially during a pandemic, as I think of Go Lead Idaho and the Women's Business and Small Business Center, you know, it, it really shows that this is the time for those partnerships to really shine. And this is what's going to get us through is working with each other. And so on that note, um, I just want to say thank you to both of you for the work that you do and for just your collaborative mindset when it comes to partnering with the Venture College and or Trailhead, ultimately to benefit the people that you serve. Oh, we couldn't do it without our partners. We could not do what we do without our partners. And I think that we all have that same feeling. Thank you very much. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And I think if I'm walking away with any, um, you know, themes or comments to share with the, the all the entrepreneurs, but in particular the women entrepreneurs that that we work with in our program, it's that idea of being bold and and reaching out for help. And um, I think the the two of you are <clears throat> uh, obvious uh, mentors and. You know, the the folks that people should be reaching out to and just appreciate what you do in the community, um, your service with your organizations and outside of your organizations. Uh, and I think as Kara noted in the comments section, we'll be sharing all of the links and other resources uh, that you've talked about here in the Trailhead Slack channel. And we'll follow up with an email as well. Um, and just thank you for your time. And I'm sure we will be seeing everyone uh, on more Zoom calls, but hopefully at a happy hour or something in person sooner rather than later. Um, but until then, uh, just thank you for joining us today. Uh, be safe out there and uh, we will see you all again very soon. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Take Everybody. care. Thanks. Bye for now.